Hello and welcome to Socialism, the Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. What are the roots of women's oppression? Thousands of years ago, early human societies lived without economic classes or gender oppression. Life was basic, precarious and sometimes brutal, but all contributed what they could to producing the necessities of life and men and women had an equal say and social status. How did humans move from this to ways of organising society which are more advanced, but where a small, pampered minority exploits the hard work and suffering of the majority? How is this connected to women being treated as second-class citizens or commodities? And how does capitalism benefit from it? Friedrich Engels investigated these questions in 1884. Can patriarchy be analysed and overcome separately from the struggle against the economic ruling class? And what is necessary to end women's oppression, both by material privations and by backwards social attitudes, once and for all? This episode of Socialism, part of a short series on Engels, looks at Marxism and women's liberation, the origin of the family, private property and the state. So we're here this episode with Chris Thomas, who's the author of It Doesn't Have to Be Like This, Women in the Struggle for Socialism. Hello, Chris. Hello, James. And we're going to be talking today about one of Engels' most important and best known, I think, works, isn't it? The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, which deals mainly with the question of women's oppression. Is that right? That's right. I suppose the first question we should ask then, Chris, is how are the ideas of Engels relevant to the struggle against gender inequality and women's discrimination and oppression in capitalist society today. Okay, well just to start just briefly about the situation at the moment because the COVID pandemic has really exposed all of the inequalities, the existing inequalities in society and has then amplified them and that includes the question of gender inequality, the gender inequality that women face. I mean just for example women are one and a half times more likely than men to have been furloughed or to have lost their jobs or to have had to quit their jobs because of the pandemic. And they're 50% more likely to have had their hours cut. And then if you look at domestic violence, which is another pandemic, really, mm. COVID has shone a spotlight on that. It affects one in four women at some time in their lives. And even in normal times, two women a week are killed by their partner or ex-partner, which is a horrendous figure. But in the first lockdown, that went up to five women a week. Wow. And there's been a huge increase in the number of women trying to access services either online or by phone. Services for women experience domestic violence. So it has really shone a light on that. And what has happened basically is that women have gone into this pandemic, particularly working class women, have gone into it economically and socially disadvantaged and they're going to come out of it in an even worse situation. And what Engels did is to explain why that is, why women face discrimination and inequality and most importantly what we can do about it. I mean, The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State was the main book that he outlined his ideas on women's oppression. It was published in 1884, so it was a long time ago. It, <laughs> it is a bit dated, including some of the language that's used in the book. But the general ideas are still relevant today. It was the first socialist publication to explain that women's inequality, their second-class status in society, hasn't always existed, that it isn't a natural thing. And that was a really explosive argument mm. at the end of the 19th century because, you know, women's inferior status was considered to be totally natural as a result of their biology, a God-given thing, and absolutely essential for the whole stability of society. I mean, he also challenged the role of the family, of what he called the bourgeois family within society. And that, again, that was seen as challenging the whole fabric of society. So it's quite explosive stuff. And Basically, what he did was to say that women's oppression is a class issue. And I don't mean by that that only working class women experience oppression, because clearly that's not the case. Sure. I mean, working class women are particularly economically disadvantaged. But when it comes to things like gender violence or attacks on reproductive rights, sexual harassment, those can be experienced by all women 
regardless of their economic background or their class. Although having said that, what class you come from and also your ethnicity can impact how you experience that oppression. So, for example, at the moment in Poland, the right wing government there is trying to introduce a law which would basically ban almost all abortion. Mm. That's going to affect all women in Poland. But if you've got the economic means, then you might be able to go to a nearby country to have an abortion, whereas if you're poor or working class, that may not be the case. Mm. So when Engels said that oppression is a class question, what he meant was it has its origins in class society, in the emergence of societies where a minority, an exploiting class, had control of the means of producing wealth in society and exploited the producers of that wealth. And he argued... So that means the people who were actually doing the work to... Yeah, right. the, that's right. And, and he said that before that happened, then basically people lived in egalitarian communal collective kinship groups, which he called the gens. And he argued that in those societies, there were no classes, there were no private ownership of the means of producing wealth, no exploitation. There was no state. There was no nuclear family as we know it today. And there was no oppression of women. So what evidence then did Engels base this argument on? Well, partly on Marx's, Marx was dead by then, but Marx's notebooks, but primarily on the works of Lewis Henry Morgan, who was an American amateur anthropologist who wrote a book called Ancient Society, and he mainly studied the Iroquois in North America. But basically there was very little anthropological and archaeological evidence available at that time. And that means that Engels did make some mistakes as far as detail is concerned. Sure. And he himself recognised later on that some of what he'd said would have to be changed in the light of new evidence. But what he managed to do was to use the method of historical materialism to analyse the little evidence that was there and to then outline a development of a society, which has been generally proven to be correct. I mean, a lot of evidence has obviously come out since he was writing. And you've had anthropologists who've been able to actually study, directly study, pre-class societies that existed until quite recently, actually, in their original state. And on the basis of those studies, then, you know, they basically agree that for most of the time that we've been on the planet, the humans have been on the planet, 99% actually of the time that we've been on the planet, humans lived in what would now be called hunter-gatherer societies, which the name comes from the way that they made a living by Mm. hunting animals and by gathering other foodstuffs. And, you know, basically the size of those groups and how they worked would vary depending on the environment and the geographical situation. But in general, they weren't very big groups, maybe about an average of about 30 people. All able-bodied members of the group were involved in obtaining food. And that food was then collectively shared within the group. And decision-making was also collective. There were sometimes some members who might be, if their ideas might have a little bit more influence, a little bit more sway because they were older or they had certain experience, but they didn't have any means of imposing their will on the other members of society. So that evidence basically backs up many of the points that Engels was making in The Origin, even if he got some of the, I won't go into the details of the things that he got wrong, but, you know, the general thrust of his argument has been borne out. There was a division of labour a gender division of labour in those societies between men and women. In general, men were responsible for hunting and fishing, Mm -hmm. and in general, women were responsible for gathering fruit, berries, roots, and for looking after children in society. But it was quite flexible, and evidence has come out actually in the last few weeks to show that in some cases women did hunt. Mm. I mean, mainly they didn't because if they were pregnant or they were nursing children, then obviously it's quite dangerous to hunt. But in some societies, women did hunt. So it was a flexible division of labour, but nevertheless, it was a division. But the important point is that that didn't lead to any economic or social disadvantage for women in society. Their contribution in terms of food, for example, was just as important as the contribution for the maintenance of the whole group as that of men. In fact, 90% of the diet was actually made up of the food that the women gathered. But (laughs) There was more prestige for the meat because they didn't have it very often. So, you know, it was prized because of that. But, you know, it was not an equal, but both were as important as each other in terms of maintaining the group. And some feminists have looked at that. They've looked at that division of labour that existed on a gender basis. And they said, well, that just shows that women have always been oppressed, that, you know, their reproduction, the fact that they have to give birth to children means that they're oppressed now and they were oppressed then. But 
what they do is they're looking at those early societies basically through the lens of capitalism of the society that we live in at the moment because Mm. under capitalism there's no doubt about it that if you have children particularly if you're a working class woman then you are quite severely in many cases economically and socially disadvantaged. I mean, just to come back to the question of the pandemic, the main reason why so many women have lost their jobs is because they're concentrated in the low paid, part time, insecure jobs in retail and hospitality. Those are where the main job losses are being made. And the main reason that they're concentrated in those jobs is because they have the main responsibility for caring for children. That limits the kind of work that they can do. And that, again, has been really clear during the pandemic because even though men have, in many cases, spent more time at home, either because they've been furloughed or they're working from home, Mm. women have still done 60% more childcare than men. And during lockdown, the first lockdown, 70% of the homeschooling of children was carried out by women, also One third of those women who have lost their jobs or had their hours cut, that has happened because they couldn't find the childcare that they wanted. So Mm. there's a huge disadvantage, but that wasn't the case in early societies. Looking after children under capitalism is sort of a private thing that women do, you know, individually within the family. But in those societies, it was a public thing that was carried out on behalf of the whole group. And so this is what Engels is attacking then when he talks about the nuclear family being a bourgeois construction, is it? Yeah, the nuclear family didn't exist in the way that it exists today. Relationships were quite flexible. And if a relationship broke down, it would be no disadvantage to the women or the children because the whole group looked after each other. Mm. And you know they weren't economically dependent on an individual man. And that, again, is completely different from the situation today because you know if you become a single parent, in most cases, you're going to be struggling economically, probably living in poverty. So it was a very different situation then. So I think a lot of people hearing this description of societies before there was class in human civilization might regard them as quite idyllic. Well, obviously, <laughs> it was still a very basic sort of society <laughs> yeah. and very hard... But how did things change? Well, again, the evidence bears out the general thrust of the ideas that there were some details, again, you got wrong, but the general thrust of the ideas that Engels put forward. And that is that as the situation for women changed, as the economic basis of society changed, that then had a knock on effect on social relations, social institutions, on the ideas in society. And the way Engels posed it was that then led to the historic defeat of the female sex. And generally, anthropologists agree that around about eight to 10,000 years ago, there was an economic revolution, what is often called an agricultural revolution or a Neolithic revolution. And basically, some hunter-gatherer societies discovered a new way of making a living based on the domestication of animals and the cultivation of crops. Okay. Now, Engels wrote about that. He thought that they domesticated animals first and then cultivated crops, but in actual fact, in historic terms, it happened more or less at the same time. But that meant that those groups went from being nomadic groups that you know, wandered around hunting and gathering to more settled societies. The population grew. Mm-hmm. And for the first time, they could produce a surplus. They could produce more food over and above their immediate needs. Okay. And so that could then be used in the bad times, if there was a drought or a famine, but it could also be used for some members of the group to remove themselves directly from production and to be involved in other tasks like pottery or metalwork and other sort of artisan roles. And to begin with, that surplus that was produced was the property of the whole group. It belonged to everybody. Mm -hmm. But the production of that surplus had to be organised. The surplus had to be distributed, it had to be guarded, traded as well. And to begin with, those tasks were also carried out on behalf of the group, the individual and the groups that carried out those tasks. They did it on behalf of everybody and they didn't get any particular material benefit or power from doing that. But gradually over time, and we're talking about thousands of years, then the processes were laid for these groups to become classes, basically, Mm. extracting the surplus production from the producing classes and expropriating that surplus for themselves. And as they needed to make sure that people carried on producing and they needed to control the producers, then you also had the development of a state apparatus and also an ideological apparatus as well to try and justify their rule, the rule of the ruling class. 
I mean, I've made that sound like it happened, you know, in about five minutes. I mean, we're talking about processes that took place over thousands of years, and inevitably sure. that's really schematic, and in, you know, there's much more detail, which I can't go into. Not all societies developed in that way. Not all hunter-gatherer societies became class societies. Some societies became stratified and hierarchised, but they didn't actually develop into class societies. Some became class societies and then collapsed again. So there were lots of processes going. It wasn't a linear automatic process but that was the general way that society developed so we've seen here part of the title the origin of the state of organized violence to protect this privileged minority at the top who's living off the backs of everyone else how exactly did women become second-class citizens as part of this well, that is a good question. And Engels didn't actually answer that question. <laughs> he didn't really have any evidence to be able to. And even today, we can't know for sure how that happened. But all of the evidence points to the fact that it was because of the division of labour, the gender division of labour, which wasn't disadvantageous for women under the old way of organising society, the hunter-gatherer communal society. But once these new economic processes develop then it did become disadvantageous. So when societies first became settled and they cultivated crops, it was mainly done on the basis of horticulture, small-scale horticulture, and women that carried out the main labour. But as societies developed into agricultural societies, large-scale agricultural societies, where you had the use of the plough, you had the use of big irrigation schemes, mm. then it was men that carried out those tasks again, because physically, with women being pregnant and that, it wouldn't have been a good idea for them to have done those tasks. And men were more associated with the production of the surplus, the guarding, the distribution, the trading of the surplus. Mm. And it was on that basis, probably, and we can't say for sure, but that's what makes sense, that men of the ruling class came to control the surplus and the means of producing wealth. And also, as part of that process, the household or the family replaced the communal group as the main economic and social unit in society okay. and production was organised through the male head of household and that completely changed the situation for ruling class women we're talking about here because you now have men who controlled the means of producing wealth and controlled the wealth in society they wanted to pass on that wealth and that property onto their children onto their heirs and they were male heirs of course and <laughs> they wanted to be sure of the paternity Right. Of their children, they didn't want their wealth to be dispersed you know, unnecessarily. So as part of that process, women of the ruling class obviously had economic advantages of being part of the ruling class, the dominant economic class. But at the same time, they literally became the private property of men mm. within the family, under the control either of their father or of their husband. And Engels looked mainly at ancient Greece and ancient Rome slave societies when he was looking at how women came to be oppressed. They weren't the first class societies, but that doesn't really matter because the general processes and how it affected women are more or less right. And basically what happened was that women of the ruling class, their main role became giving birth to children who were going to inherit property. And whereas in pre-class society, women's sexuality was more or less free, mm -hmm. now women's sexuality and their reproduction, because of wanting to ensure paternity, came under the control and the authority of men within the family. And so it was vital to make sure that women were chaste and that they were monogamous. Mm -hmm. And so in most cases, they spent most of their time at home, guarded. If they went out, they had to have somebody with them. They had to wear a veil. If they committed adultery, that was a terrible crime, whereas it's perfectly all right for men to have no problem whatsoever. And, you know, men were... It was legitimate for men to use violence and force to control women. In fact, in some cases, it was actually encouraged. Mm. And if a woman was raped... That was a crime against the property of the man, not a crime against or the father the, or the, the husband. Woman. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And women basically became commodities. I mean, again, I'm talking about women of the ruling class, but in terms of you know, marriage, marriage was a means of exchanging commodities in order to maintain and extend wealth. And that was the role that marriage played. And as the state apparatus developed, then the legal system, religion, the church, education system, all of those things were used to reinforce that inferior situation of women and basically to deny them rights in society. And that is all of those processes. And again, we're talking about something that took place over thousands of years, mm. but it laid the basis for all of the oppression, the discrimination, the equality that women face today. It's the basis for the economic inequality that women face. It's the basis for gender violence, for sexual harassment, for the double standards that you've got 
regarding men and women, the stereotyping of the roles that men and women play in society. All of those things have their roots in those processes in the development of class society. And you will hear feminists say that the main cause of women's oppression is the patriarchy. Okay. But what Engels showed is there is no patriarchy, there's no structure of patriarchy that's separate from class society. Right. Women's oppression and class society developed together. They were a part of the same process and they're intrinsically linked together. And that's also the case and still the case under capitalism today. So, I mean, what happened basically is that, I mean, really, I am to cut in a long story short here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> capitalism as a system inherited gender inequality and the patriarchal family mm. from previous class societies and then set about trying to modify them, to shape them and to harness them to do, suit the economic and social needs of the capitalist class. Right. So, for example, with capitalism, for the first time you had the separation of the work that women do in the home, mm -hmm. a clear separation, the work that women do in the home and work outside of the home. Yeah, that was one of the significant features of capitalist industrialisation. But capitalist ideology still promoted the idea that women's main role was in the family, mm -hmm. looking after mm -hmm. and giving birth to and raising children. And so for women of the capitalist class, it was a sign of respectability, a sign of wealth, that they didn't go out to work, that they stayed at home, the angel in the house, you know, that yeah. looked after Playing them. Playing the piano, doing their point work. <laughs> exactly. Looking after the needs of the capitalist who went out to work and made profits on the back of the workers. And marriage, you know, in the time that Engels was writing, was still a business contract. It was right. still about, you know, consolidating and exchanging wealth. It was different for the working class. It was different for women of the working class. And Engels goes into this in The Origin of the Family, that for working class women, it was considered that their main role was to give birth to and raise the next generation of workers who would be exploited in the factories and the mills and to look after the current needs of the current generation of workers. So the cleaning, the cooking, the housework, all of the things that would be necessary to look after the current workers. And all of those people in society who capitalism considered to be unproductive because they couldn't create a profit. Okay. So the unemployed, the disabled, the elderly. Right. That was the role of women in the family to look after them. <laughs> and all of that, of course, was unpaid. Right. Because it was their natural role. And <laughs> yeah. that was what they were, so they were supposed to do. Yeah. And that has saved capitalism so much money. I mean, it, you know, historically, but also today, billions of pounds. It's estimated that the amount that is saved by that unpaid labour is equivalent to some of the actual GDPs of countries, you know, where... Total economic output yeah, of the country. Yeah, 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 is the value of that unpaid labour. And, of course, if women didn't do that, then those services would have to be provided by the state or workers would have to be paid a lot more wages so that they could buy those services. Sure. And both of those would hit the profits of the capitalists. Mm. So it's enormously advantageous for them to have maintained the family and the gender inequality within the family in that way. But the family has also played a social role, not just an economic role. I mean, this patriarchal, hierarchical family, you know, with their male head of household and the dependent women and children, everybody knowing their place in society. It's a means of disciplining people, mm. people learning what their roles are should be mm. and socialising basically right. so it's played that role and it's been a scapegoat as well because it's you know blame feckless women for the fact that you know their children are poor or their children turn to crime not society itself mm. and of course the other thing is that because the family was so important and women's role within the family was so economically and socially important it meant that other social arrangements other family arrangements if you like were discouraged and so single parents, if you, if you gave birth outside of marriage, then you were punished or stigmatised. Yeah. And, of course, homosexuality was outlawed and was criminalised. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's an enormous burden over thousands of years has been landed on women. And it seems to have only gotten worse and more complicated under capitalism. So what solution did Engels propose then to this enormous historic oppression? Yeah, because that's important. I mean, he didn't just outline and explain how women came to be oppressed. He used that to then explain what would be necessary to end women's oppression. So he wrote was that the first prerequisite for women's liberation mm -hmm. would be for women to be brought, this is his words, to be brought into public industry. And what he meant by that was women coming out of the isolation of the home 
into the workplace where they could see that the problems that they were experiencing weren't individual problems but were collective problems and that they could find a collective solution to those problems alongside of working class men in the workplace and if you look at the situation today then that prerequisite has been met yeah. because before the pandemic 75 percent of women with dependent children went out to work that's one of the highest levels in the world mm. actually and it's a huge social revolution if you think that before the second world war only 10 percent of married women went out to work Mm. so really really massive change in situation that has had a huge effect it's had a huge effect on women's attitudes it's had a huge effect on attitudes generally within society I mean you just take something like domestic violence for example you know it's much more understood by women themselves and by society generally that it's not as a result of their individual failings right. and that they don't have to tolerate it. Mm. You know, that's not something they have to put up with, basically. There's been a change in attitudes as far as that's concerned. You've had a big increase in women moving into the trade unions mm. and taking issues like domestic violence and sexual harassment and reproductive rights into their unions, campaigning for the union leaders to actually do something about those issues. Mm. I mean, I can't go into all the ways that society has changed, but, you know, even social attitudes in general, then obviously there's much more tolerance now of alternative social ar- arrangements. Sure. You know, lone parents are less stigmatised. You can have kids outside of marriage. It's not a problem. Mm. And of course, same-sex relationships are legal. Marriage is legal now. So, you know, there has been a big change that's taken place, but it hasn't brought about equality. Mm. And it certainly hasn't brought about liberation. And that's because Engel said there was a second <laughs> prerequisite. Right, OK, because this necessary. is important, isn't it? Because, you know, this point, for example, about more women understanding they don't have to put up with domestic violence, that's not the same as actually being able to escape it, is it? Exactly. And that's a very key point. And he said that what was needed was that all of the unpaid work that women carried out in the home needed to be socialised. OK. And so the childcare looking after the unproductive members, the elderly, the disabled, services for those. All of that housework, the drudgery of housework, as Engels referred to it, those should be provided collectively by the state, should be the responsibility, the collective responsibility of the state, much as they were in the early societies, if you like, it was carried out publicly on behalf of everybody. But just on a higher level. Uh, Yeah, exactly, on a much higher level. But if you look at the situation today, that hasn't happened. Or what has happened is, you know, the working class historically has fought for some of the work that women carried out in the home to be provided by the state in the form of services. Yeah, that's right. But even at the peak of capitalism in the post-war boom, there was never enough nurseries or childcare for women. And now, after more than a decade of austerity, of cuts, of privatisation, then many of those services that were provided by the state have been decimated. Mm. You know, the welfare state has been cut to the bone and that's had a terrible effect on women women have borne the brunt of that both because they're the main workers in the public sector and they've lost their jobs or had their hours and conditions made worse and of course they've lost those services which they desperately rely on and desperately need and you can see the repercussions of that in the pandemic at the moment i mean we've seen it with social care obviously the privatized social care what that's meant Twenty thousand people have unnecessarily died yeah. because of that but there's also a disastrous situation with the privatized child care system as well i mean even before the pandemic it was very difficult for women to find affordable child care but mm. it's got much worse now in fact the child care in this country is the second most expensive in the world up in New Zealand (laughs) oh yes New Zealand of course with its uh, female prime minister oh well there you go (laughs) and now it's got even worse because they're saying that something like 25% of childcare providers could go bust in the next few months because they're not making the profits Mm. that they want to be making because of the pandemic and the areas where they're most likely to be closed down are in the poorer working class areas because in the richer areas they can afford to put the fees up knowing that parents will pay for them so it's a disastrous situation as far as childcare is concerned and absolutely crying out for it to be brought into public ownership but the reality is that if capitalism couldn't provide the state services that women need at the peak of the post-war boom (laughs) then it's not going to do that now in a situation where we're in a really profound crisis of capitalism and Engels wrote about this and he said what is needed is a fundamental change in the way that society is organised is structured and is run basically a, a socialist revolution 
you know, you had an economic revolution 10,000 years ago, brought about class society, led to the oppression of women. Today, the opposite would take place. Right. The socialist revolution would end class society and it would lay the basis for ending the oppression of women. But that would mean moving away from an economy that's based on the private ownership of the means of producing wealth by a small, super-rich capitalist minority that's only interested in making profits mm. and replacing that with an economy where the major industries are in public ownership and they're democratically controlled, run and planned by the working class as a whole. And that would immediately release the resources that would be necessary for changing the economic situation that women face, but also lay the basis for ending the broader oppression that women face. Maybe I could just give some examples of what socialism would mean. Yeah, Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mean, obviously it would improve the situation both men and women, but one thing it would mean would be a shorter working week, which means that everybody would have more time for leisure, they'd have more time for family, friends... Also participating in the running of society, Mm -hmm. the democratic running of society. As far as women are concerned, the fact that socialism would be able to guarantee everybody a decent job with a decent wage, then women would be completely economically independent, which obviously is very important, particularly Mm -hmm. from the point of view of being able to leave unhappy relationships or violent relationships. And it would mean that people could choose how they had their personal relations. I mean, even in the origin of the family, Engels didn't sort of say how he thought the family would be or how relationships would be in a socialist society he said oh we'll leave that to the next generation (laughs) which is you know it's sensible (laughs) but but basically we would have real choice about how we formed our personal relationships Mm. without all the economic and social restraints that you've got under capitalism and it would mean that we could actually do what Engels said we could socialize the unpaid labor of women within the home so the state could provide quality flexible child care which we democratically run by the people who worked in the industry and by the parents that use them the same with social care you could have good quality community restaurants Mm. which I mean maybe some people like going shopping and cooking and cleaning I don't and I would be quite happy (laughs) to go into you know a community restaurant you could provide obviously decent housing all of those things would have a really big effect on women's lives and transforming their lives so just a quick question then Mm. you talked about that laying the material basis i mean does that mean that we lift women out of the domestic drudgery and domestic violence just stops and backwards attitudes just go away no (laughs) and that's the other thing is that the other if you like, the sort of sexual, cultural oppression, violence against women, it would take much longer for those to disappear because, precisely because, the ideas that underpin them go back so many thousands of years. And although the economic basis for those ideas has disappeared a long time ago, nevertheless, those ideas have continued. Mm. And capitalism, actually, in the way that it's structured and its own ideological apparatus, even though there's been been big changes, big modifications, it still reinforces and still continues those outdated and outmoded ideas. And so they're quite deeply rooted in society. Engels didn't really go into any of this. In a way, we've updated, if you like, Engels' ideas to take up the question of the cultural and sexual oppression of women. But, you know, if you had a situation where you no longer had inequality in the family Mm -hmm. and you no longer had inequality in the workplace, then that would lay the basis for the sexual and cultural oppression of women to disappear. Also, you'd have completely different values in society. If you think that capitalism is based on inequalities of power and wealth, hierarchies, that capitalism quite happily uses violence to back up its control, you know, either through hammering strikers or you know protesters or going to war and all of the values in society reflect themselves in personal relationships in the way that people relate together and Mm. in the culture of society and in socialism you'd have completely different values you know the values would be based on solidarity on cooperation not on competition and they would reflect themselves in people's personal relations as well, just as they did in early societies. So, you know, all of the values of society would change. And I think the other thing that's important, you wouldn't have a privately owned media like right. at the moment. Yeah. You wouldn't have privately owned beauty industry, leisure industry, fashion industry, all the other industries, you know, which turn women bodies into commodities for profit or promote certain ways that women should look and women behave. So if you removed all of those things, mm. then the basis would be laid 
not just for improving the material situation, but also the broader, wider oppression that women face. So you probably also need to have a bit of an education campaign course, yeah. as well, you know, but over time, and certainly the next generation, I mean, I saw some figures the other day that saying that by the age of four, children have already assimilated you know, gender roles about what is appropriate, how people should look, how they should behave, what jobs are appropriate for men, what jobs are appropriate. That's by the age of four. Yeah, with the Barbie and the action man. Exactly, but in a different society with different values and obviously over time, then those ideas would change. So once you have a society which is organised such that you don't need to defend this tiny elite at the top, by basing itself on all these outdated ideas and actually fostering divisions in society to keep people at each other's throats rather than identifying the true enemy, in this case the capitalists, it's possible to, over time, finally eradicate those ideas. Whereas under the current way that society is organised, they keep repeating themselves and reproducing themselves in different ways, which is why this point you made earlier about the patriarchy not being separate and distinct to class society is so important because simply campaigning against the patriarchy doesn't solve the problem. We have to abolish capitalism. So I suppose the question then is... Do we need to abolish capitalism before we can make any steps forward? Do we just have to go for socialism and then leave all these questions about ending oppression to afterwards? No, absolutely not. We're not saying, I'm not saying, Engels wasn't saying that we just wait for socialism and everything will be okay. That's good. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, obviously, as Marxists, we're the hardest fight is actually against all inequality and oppression in the here and now. I mean, just to give one example, we haven't got a lot of time, but one of the most important campaigns that the Socialist Party, or most successful campaigns that the Socialist Party has been involved in was the campaign against domestic violence which we launched in the 1990s mm-hmm. but it became a much bigger campaign than just the socialist party but we campaigned then to change the law to help women who were experiencing domestic violence and we also campaigned to change attitudes mm. around violence against women and we succeeded in both of those cases mm. but at the same time and this relates to the point that you were making earlier we also campaigned for more funding for refuges more funding for housing for a decent minimum wage that would allow women to actually have the resources to leave or make it easier if you like for women to actually leave violent relationships and at the same time we said that if we want to actually end violence then you have to end capitalism Mm. and so it's not enough just to change the law it's not enough just to try and change the attitudes of men which is what a lot of feminists if you like limit themselves to doing Mm. you have to also change the structures that underpin those ideas and underpin those behaviors and you know if you look at the situation recently we've seen huge movements by women internationally the last three years really in a whole number of countries Mm. women moving into struggle against their specific oppression and these have been very important movements because you've seen a whole new generation of young women becoming radicalized for the first time and once you start to move into action then your ideas start to change and you're open to the idea of changing things more broadly of actually Mm. changing society and some of those movements have actually made some gains Mm. I mean I suppose talked about Poland earlier yeah. in 2016 mass movement there by women actually stopped the government at that stage restricting abortion rights and even now in the last few weeks they've temporarily taken a step back and the latest attacks that they've tried to put forward on abortion rights and it's been a really impressive movement that's been taking place there mm. and it's actually gone broader than abortion rights that was the trigger mm. But it's also been a catalyst for some of the other grievances that people have about the way the government's conducted the pandemic, you know, inequality and other things in society. So those have been very important movements. You know, the miners and the farmers have joined them, haven't they? It, and these are mostly men who were participating in this movement. Exactly. So they are important and they can make some gains, but the gains are limited. They're limited because of the crisis of capitalism, because of the economic crisis that capitalism So is, the bosses is can in. afford to make fewer concessions. They can make, yeah, they can make some concessions, mm. but, you know, they will resist making other concessions and of course the most important point is that those movements on their own can't end oppression because to end oppression as Engels explained you have to end capitalism you have to end class society those movements can be part of the struggle to end capitalism and end oppression but in and of themselves they can't do it because both Marx and Engels explain that the central role 
in Indian capitalism is played by the working class, by the united working class. Okay. Because... Because working class women, of course, are part of the working class. Absolutely. In fact, they're not just part of the working class in Britain, they're the majority. Right. Or they're a majority of the organised working class in the trade unions. Mm. But the working class has the economic interest in changing society because of the exploitation, but also it potentially has the collective power to end capitalism because of its role in the production process, because it creates the profits. And we've seen in the pandemic, we're not just talking about workers. I mean, you said about women workers. We're not just talking about workers who directly produce a profit, but even those who indirectly. For example, when the lockdown took place Mm. and the schools were closed... Mm -hmm whole sections of the economy came to a halt. So the teachers actually have (laughs) potentially quite a lot of power. Because their parents are looking after the kids, so they can't go to work. Yeah, and that's why the Tories have been so desperate to keep the schools open Mm. this time, even though it's clear that it's spreading the virus. But, you know, that just shows, you know, the the strength, the potential strength that working class people have. And like you say, women are a very much, obviously, much more important part of the workforce than they were when Engels was writing The Origin of the Family. It's been one of the positive aspects of the pandemic is that you've seen an increase in trade union membership and most of that has been in sectors that organise women Mm. so you know in social care in education and they're not just joining unions to be passive members they're actually joining them to get active to get stuck in to try and fight to change their situation so the potential is there for that struggle, a united struggle between working class men and working class women And and it has to be both it has to be both yeah it has to be both united together Ending capitalism also, you need a party. Mm-hmm. You need a party. I don't know, I think this is very important for women, is that you have to have a party that can give a vision of how things could be different, mm-hmm. of what a different kind of society would mean. I mean. That's important for everybody. I think it's particularly important for women to have this idea that there is another way to use the title of the book. It doesn't have to be like this. Mm-hmm. You know, things can be organised. But obviously a party also has to have a programme and it has to have a strategy to get from where we are today mm-hmm. to where we want to be in the future and that is obviously what we're trying to do and I think the ideas that Engels outlined in The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State and the way in which we've updated them to make them more relevant if you like to the current situation then that is going to play an important part of that program and of that strategy to end capitalism and then to end all forms of oppression, all exploitation, all inequality and all oppression. And this vision, by the way, I think it's also worth mentioning that it's important because, of course, there are feminists who say what we simply need is more women at the top of the existing structures, isn't it? And as we learned from Thatcher, as we'll learn with Joe Biden's 50% female cabinet, as women are presumably experiencing in New Zealand right now, that's not actually enough, is it? Absolutely. No, it's not the gender of the person that's important. It's what programme they have and whether they're fighting to improve the situation for working class women. That's what's really important. Well, as ever, if you like what you've heard, recommend us to your co-workers and friends, donate to help fund us, and if you agree... Join the Socialists. Thank you very much, Chris. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for a Workers' International. Today we heard from Chris Thomas, speaking to me, James Ivans. This episode was edited by Nick Hart. You can find further reading in the notes in your podcast app and at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you want to get in touch, email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk. Do you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for? We need you. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. If you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for a Workers' International by visiting socialistworld.net. Socialism, the podcast, has no wealthy backers. We rely on funding from the working class, which maintains our political independence. So help us take the fight to the capitalists. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Till next time, solidarity.